What's going on, everyone? You're tuned in to the Founder Hour podcast. I'm your co-host, Pat, and today's guest on the show is Chef Wolfgang Puck. He's a world-famous chef, restaurateur, actor, and a name that's become synonymous with the best of restaurant hospitality and the ultimate in all aspects of the culinary arts. Over the last 40 years, he's built a brand that encompasses three companies, Wolfgang Puck Fine Dining Group, which includes his flagship restaurant, Spago, Wolfgang Puck Catering, and Wolfgang Puck Worldwide Incorporated. In this episode, we cover a ton of topics, including his childhood growing up in Austria, how he built his hospitality empire, his thoughts on the future of restaurants, and much, much more. Please enjoy our conversation with Wolfgang Puck. Wolfgang, you were telling us right now that you took a four-day trip and you were just so worried about spending money. So tell us yeah. a little bit about that philosophy. Well, that you know, it is such a big problem when you grew up poor like me. We had meat once a week, you know. We had uh, two pairs of shoes, that was it. And um, one pair of long pants and the rest was shorts. I remember walking barefoot most of the summer. So... I grew up like nothing got wasted. So, for example, uh, two weeks ago, I got into an argument with my wife about four days extra on vacation this year. And don't forget, I'm not 27 years old. I'm 72. <laughs> so, yeah, the other way around. And I, she said, why you want to take four extra days? You work all your life. Look, over 55 years now. And... Uh, what do you work for? The family is just as important as your business. And I say, ah, oh, but the business, the business, the business. Then, unfortunately, Saturday a week ago, I went to see Mark Peel at the hospital, who was my first chef at Spargo and a very good friend of mine, a very hard worker, a very sweet man. Really, I couldn't say good enough things about him. And they told me he has terminal cancer. Twelve hours later, he was dead. But I went home and told my wife, you know, let's just take more days. You know what? You were right. I'm an idiot. I should take more vacation and enjoy life. Because what are we working for? You know, the children can make their own money. Let's (laughs) (laughs) let's, uh, spend some. It's a shame that, you know, like obviously death has to sort of put things into perspective, but it's so true. It happens all the time. I mean, you just, you just realize how short life is and you, yeah. you realize like, you know, I'm, 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 I'm working my butt off every day. Sometimes I just need to, need to take some time for myself. You no, know, it's nice to get away with family, with friends, enjoy life and do things you don't do normally, you know? So I'm going to go to Sardinia. We're going to go to uh, Turkey and Greece and hang out with friends there. I think it's going to be fantastic. Well, once I'm there, I forget about it a little bit and <laughs> said, okay, let's have another glass of tequila or another shot of tequila or another bottle of champagne <laughs> exactly. or some good wine, you I'm, know, and celebrate life. I'm sure you've traveled a lot, but for, for work, how, how often have you traveled for leisure, just like throughout your career maybe? You know, it is so funny because I always try to mix both together. So yeah. for years, I told uh, my family, okay, for Christmas, we're going to go to Vail on vacation in the snow, skiing. Well, I didn't tell them, we have a restaurant there, and every night at 4 o'clock, I'm going to go to cook. <laughs> in the summer, or not, and for New Year's, so it sounded so good to them. For New Year's, I said, we're going to go to Maui. Maui is amazing. It's warm. You don't need all the clothes like skiing. Well, they found out I have a restaurant there too, <laughs> and I went to work every night. I went back from the beach at 4 o'clock. Yeah. I went to the restaurant, and they had to wait until 9, 9.30 to have dinner with me. And that's, you know, it is a vacation, but not really, because oh, yeah. uh, I think the kids had to wait around for me. I wasn't there for them at an important part, which is dinner. By the time they had dinner, they were so tired and yeah. wanted to go to the room and uh, play their games or whatever. So now I decided, you know, I should take more time where I don't go to work. That's why I love to go to Turkey. But, oh, I shouldn't tell you, because I'm going to Turkey, to Istanbul first. We have a restaurant there, too. <laughs> <laughs> after that, after that, we are going down to Bodrum and go on a boat. So there's no restaurant of ours on a boat. Now it's like I, you know, I have to be careful not to open up a restaurant at places that you know I want to travel to or family wants to travel totally, to. Totally, totally. So <laughs> two years ago or three years ago, we were in Sardinia at the Cala di Volpi, a great hotel, and we love it there. The beach is nice. The kids have friends there and everything. And then the owner comes to me and says, Wolfgang, why you don't open a Spago here? And I said, what a great idea. And I said, we make a deal. We can stay for free a month or whatever and get paid a little bit. 
And then I told uh, Galila, I said, that's such a good idea. And at one point she said, oh, that sounds good. And Galila is your wife, right? Galila is my wife, yeah. So, And then all of a sudden she comes up. She said, Wolfgang, you're crazy. This is our favorite vacation spot. What do you want? The people getting off their yacht and say, Wolfgang, I want a table at 8 o'clock. I hope you're going to be there serving us. We're going to be on the beach there. Our friends going to say, can we get a reservation? They don't want to give us one. Then we have to go somewhere else on a vacation. This is just going to be another workplace. So exactly. I think somehow, I, I mean, in my head, I tried to get it deal so i can walk and be on vacation <laughs> you know you know what i love about all of these stories that you just said was that there are two there are these two underlying messages right of growing up with not much money yeah. and knowing the value of hard work and always working because it may not be there the next yeah. day right and i think a lot of people you know us included have been in that position with our families where you know, my parents and Pat's parents are both immigrants, right? Yeah. You know, Pat's parents came from uh, Iran. My parents came from Lebanon and Syria. Of, we're Armenian by, you know, by ethnicity. But we struggled a lot. So we know what it feels like to have nothing, yeah. right? At times, my parents had to work extra jobs to just feed us. We didn't know that growing up. We know that now, right? But you okay. obviously had that mentality. Talk, walk us a little bit through your childhood and what that was like and why it's obviously made such a huge impact on you so, at this age. I grew up in the countryside in Austria and uh, fairly poor, you know. I, I didn't know we were that poor or whatever. But, you know, we had meat once a week. We had a house with no plumbing inside. The toilets were 300 feet outside in the garden, you know, at the end of the garden, a little wooden shack. And uh, if we wanted hot water, we had to heat up the stove. If we wanted heat in the house, we wanted to he had to heat up the stove. In the winter time, I remember the walls were shimmering with frost in the mm. inside, and we were sleeping right next to it. Thank yeah. God we had good covers or whatever. But uh, it was uh, uh, really interesting. And meat, we had Sunday, we had Wiener Schnitzel or maybe a fried chicken in the springtime. But mostly, my grandmother and my mother were very good cooks. And they cooked a lot of noodles, a lot of rice, and stuff like that. I remember when my mother used to, or my grandmother used to make goulash. So she always made it with uh, a lot of sauce. Mm. So we had the goulash, and we, she baked some uh, rolls and everything to go with it. So mainly we had like two small pieces of meat and the rolls, so we soaked up the sauce mm. and ate the bread with it. The next day or two days later... She cut potatoes into pieces and cooked it in a goulash sauce, and we had potato goulash. So we liked it as kids, and we said that was normal. That's all but, you knew. But they knew how to spend a little money and keep it going for a long uh, uh, time. And where did they get that sort of desire or passion for cooking? Like, what, did it come from just family, or did were they like did they sort of go out of their way to you learn? You know, we got lucky because we had the house, but we had a big garden. You know, at that time, everybody had their own garden because there was no supermarket. So, you mm. know, if you had carrots, you put them uh, in the fall down in the cellar into sand and earth mixed together. The same thing with celery balls, the same thing with salad, with potatoes. So we kept all that. And then in the wintertime, we didn't have salad. We didn't have, uh, uh, you know, fresh things out of the garden. We had that in the spring and summer and fall. So for about four months, you know, from November to April, there wasn't much, but we ate a lot of noodle dishes, and some of them were so delicious. I still make one. It's called the cheese uh, ravioli, Wolfgang's favorite cheese ravioli. We have it at the menu in our restaurants, mm -hmm. and it's still one of my favorite dishes. Yet it was farmer's cheese from the farmer next door with potatoes, a little mint, a little parsley, some sautéed onion, like almost like a pierogi style, and uh, with a lot of brown butter because we got the butter and the cream and the milk from our farmer next to us. So... To me, it was so good. You know, mm -hmm. it was delicious. I would not have wanted a steak or a veal job or something. Mm -hmm. I really liked it. And for dinner, my mother used to make Kaiserschmann or Palachinken. Palachinken are thin crepes, which she filled with apricot marmalade or raspberry marmalade, and then rolled them together, a little powder sugar on top, and a glass of milk. That was our dinner. Or Kaiserschmann, which is more like a pancake, and she tore it up with two forks, put sugar on it to make it really sweet and caramelized, 
and then serve it with apple compote or plum compote, whatever she made during the summertime. And then she put it in this mason charts and kept it for the winter. So mm. for us kids, it was great. You know, I right. got such a sweet tooth still until today <laughs> that for me, if I could, I would start dinner with desserts. That's how much I got yeah. used to it and that's how much I liked it. D did you consider having a challenging childhood by any means or was it was it a uh, rough upbringing you know i have great childhood memories was mostly about the food my mother cooked or my grandmother cooked the smell in the house when she made wiener schnitzel the smell when she baked a, a cake or a kugelhopf or something like that i still smell it today uh, but my stepfather was like the worst he was like a terrorist to the family you know he both abused me and my sister and my mom too, mentally and physically. He was drunk. I think he was bipolar or some crazy things with his head. Maybe it was during the war. It had maybe something to PTSD do with his head. PTSD or some sort. Huh? PTSD or something Yeah, like that, exactly. Yeah. You know, so at that time in the countryside, you didn't go to a doctor. They didn't put you somewhere you're crazy or give you pills yeah. or give you Xanax or whatever the pills are today. Yeah. So... He was just impossible. He always told me I was good for nothing. Uh, nothing ever will be out of me. Nothing, I don't gonna achieve anything. And she was all, he was always so negative toward me. And then I could not wait to get out of the house. So when I was 14, my mother found me a job as a cook's apprentice about 50 miles away. And you know, we didn't have a car, we didn't have telephones or anything. So I went there and the chef was almost like, my stepfather, also a crazy, screaming, hitting people. I mean, that was totally normal. You know, if you did something, you did, they thought it wasn't right, he kicked you in the butt or hit you in the head or whatever it was. I mean, today, they would be in prison, rightfully oh, so, you yeah. know. And But that, that day, he was totally, you couldn't accept it. If I complained to my father or my mother, they said, you know what? Maybe you did something wrong. He had the right to do it. Yeah, you, know? you deserved it. You deserved it, yeah, exactly. <laughs> So it was bad. And after about three weeks, I remember I was just doing the potatoes and peel them, cut them and put them on the stove and make the mashed potatoes where we puree them with the machine and everything. And then we ran out of, uh, of potatoes, of potato puree, of the mashed potatoes. The chef called me over at the end of Sunday lunch and said, oh, you're good for nothing. You go, better go home to your mother. You're fired and we don't want you here anymore. And I I didn't know what to do, and that evening uh, I went on the bridge there, which go over this big Drau River, and I said, I'm going to jump in the water, I'm going to kill myself, I don't want to live, you know, because uh, I don't know where to go anymore. And so when I was uh, uh, like standing on a bridge for about 45 minutes or so, and all of a sudden I get like a light bulb go up in my head, and I said, I'm going to go back tomorrow and see what's happened. If it's still so bad, well, I always, he always can fire me again. So I went back. I couldn't sleep all night, obviously. I went at 7 o'clock to the restaurant, and uh, the apprentice who was ahead of me was so excited to see me back because if not, he would have to peel potatoes and uh, carrots and onions and all that stuff. He hid me in the vegetable cellar, and I was peeling there down, and he used to bring me a little sandwich or soup or something down to eat, and I snuck in and I snuck out of the restaurant when the chef wasn't there. And one day, a few weeks later, he comes down and sees me there and says, screaming, what are you doing here? You're fired. We don't want you here. And then all goes on and on. And he grabs me by my shirt and tries to pull me out. But I was holding on to the potato bags and he couldn't get me out. And then he didn't know what to do. He didn't hit me at that time, but he hit me plenty before. And uh, uh, he called the owner of the hotel and says, you know, this kid is terrible. We can, uh, he's too little. I was four foot nine or something like that. So he said he should go home to his mother and this and that. And I said, I'm not going home. I'm not going home. And finally the owner said, okay, uh, let me deal with it. I'm going to send him to the other hotel we own in uh, town. And uh, maybe he will be okay there. If not, if he's not okay there, he has to go. So they sent me there and they, they had a the woman chef and she was nice and said, you know, if you don't make any waves, just do your work, everything will be fine. So don't worry, just be quiet and do your job. And that's what I did. And it got better a little bit. And I did my three years there and finally got my certificate that I'm a cook. Yeah. And so throughout this whole time, I mean, that's just a crazy story of, of like 
you know, what you had to go through at such a young age. But throughout this whole time, did you have this like grand vision of what you hope to become, whether it was in the food industry or something else? Like, were you thinking that far ahead or were you just trying to make it to the next day? I was trying to make it through the next day or the next week, maybe. You know, I had no idea I'm going to be a cook, actually, at that time. I just used that as a pretext to leave my stepfather's home. So that was my first motivation. That after spending three years there, uh, I went to France. I thought I'm going to go to France for a year, come back. And then I wrote to a friend of mine who was a truck driver, and he made really good money. And he said, you should come and be my like co-pilot for a while, and then you get your own truck you know, you know, from the company, and you can be a driver and everything, and uh, uh, you can make great money. And that's what I was thinking about doing. But then... In the restaurant in Dijon, where I worked at Trofaison, I, uh, with the owner, had a party, and I found out through the Guide Michelin, it was a party because we got one star, I found out there are two stars and three star restaurants. <laughs> and I thought this was the best restaurant in France where I worked. So then I wrote to all these three star restaurants, and then the first one to say yes was Raymond Tullier at Beaumanier. And that really changed my life. I arrived there. It's a three-star restaurant. Amazing. The chef was so passionate. The owner and chef was so passionate and everything. And uh, what, what they cooked with was amazing. The kitchen was beautiful. Everything was amazing. They, especially the ingredients. They had like six gardeners bringing the best strawberries or melons or the smallest green beans or peas and stuff like that. And then the fresh fish from Marseille, because it was like an hour away from Marseille. So we had all these amazing ingredients. And then he was going back and forth in the dining room. And I remember him bringing Picasso in the kitchen. I remember him bringing Elizabeth Taylor in the kitchen or George Pompidou, who was the president of France. So he used to know them all and he always showed them the kitchen because mm -hmm. he was so passionate about what he was doing. I mean, it had to be perfect. He, he was ruthless too, but he was passionate. But he was the first one who somehow thought I had some talent and who really thought I will be good. And mm -hmm. I remember the first time when he was, when I remember he was taking a few days off and he told the chef of the restaurant, he says, you know, I'm going uh, to Cannes for a few days and I want Wolfgang to be here in the station to make the sauces. The sauce station was the number one station in the kitchen. The French cuisine was known for its amazing sauces. So all of a sudden I felt, wow, you know what? He really liked what I do. He really liked my opinion because when he made a sauce or something, uh, you know, or I made the sauce and made him taste it. He said, okay, put a little salt, a little pepper, he used to tell me, or a little lemon juice. And when he made something, I told him the same thing. I said, well, it needs a little bit more pepper and maybe a little <laughs> But what do you think, I mean, and you can, I mean, you can brag here because this is, this is an important part of the story, I think, is what do you think made you such a good sort of chef or un understanding food so well at that age compared to perhaps your peers, other people who were in the kitchen? Like, was it just a natural innate talent? Was it because of your mother and grandmother and what you observed at a young age? Like, where did it come from? You know, it's a good question because if I could fabricate it, I would sell it, I would get rich probably, <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, I think adversity is a big part of it. I mean, telling my stepfather, you know, I don't going to come home until I have a Mercedes and I'm going to drive it into the living room through the front door. So <laughs> it, I had this anger and this revenge in me that I'm going to show him I'm not good for nothing and I'm going to be more than he is. So right. I think that's a big part of it. But if you're lucky enough in life, if you find your passion and you really love what you do, you spend so many hours doing it and then little by little you get really good at it, you know. And I think that's what happened to me. At Beaumania, I really found my mentor and Raymond Tullier was so passionate and I said, I want to be like him. And somehow it wrapped off on me, maybe because he was the first one who validated my work in the kitchen. I don't know where I came from, but then I said, I want to own my own restaurant one day. Boy, I was 19 years old, then I decided I will be a cook, I will be a chef, I want to be like this guy. I wish he would be alive today and I would send him a plane to come over and here. And when did, when did he pass? Oh, he passed like 20 years ago. Okay. Wolfgang, you bring up a couple of terms like passion and 
finding the work that you love to do. But for a lot of people, that doesn't come easy, right? Sometimes it takes them 10, 20, 40 years. Other times, you know, you're 14 years old, 15 years old, and you stumble upon this awesome guy who becomes your mentor. Yeah. Of, of course, you put the steps to get there. Uh, what is your advice to those that are trying to seek perhaps their passion or are trying to find what they love? You know, is, is it something that already exists in, within you or is it something that naturally comes and you have to stumble upon? I really think we all have some talent somewhere hidden, you know, in different ways. And I think, how can you really figure out to get that talent out of you? Maybe you are, would be very talented doing music or drawing or God knows what, or cooking, you know. But you don't know until you try it. And, you know, by the time I was at Bomania, I was doing that for five years already. And I knew a little bit. I wasn't a great cook or anything like that, but I really knew it. And I think I got lucky. I think there's a lot of luck involved in life, mm -hmm. too, to be at the right time at the right place. Mm -hmm. Would I have not gone there? Who knows where I would be today, you know? It's like sometimes I look back at my life and I say, why me? Why was I successful? You know, I worked with so many young chefs who I thought were just as talented as me or worked just as fast as me or could handle a station in the kitchen just as well as I did. And somehow they stayed where they are. And I think a lot of it is maybe I was born to take risks. And a lot of people are risk adverse, especially if you talk to my lawyer. If I talk to my <laughs> lawyer, Steve Wolf, you know what? I would just have one restaurant. He yeah. said, no, why would we want to put everything at risk, you know? And to me, doing risk, it's part of my excitement. You know, to that point, I think what it is, 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 is dreaming as big as you can, right? Like, because the way I look at things is, if you're going to dedicate your time or something to, to anything, right, why not try to make it as big as possible, right? Why not try to think and, and dream yeah. as big as possible? Because that's the difference between you being a line cook somewhere and you having... 10 restaurants or just a hospitality company that yeah. across multiple, right? And so it's like, it was the same thing with us when we started this podcast, right? It's like, we want to we wanna talk to the best of the best and learn their stories, right? It's, it's really setting the bar high for, for yourself because no one's going to come and do that for you. It, totally, right? yeah. So. No, no, I think, I think so too. If you can dream it, you can do it, we say. But I think uh, if you find your passion, it's easier to dream now, did I dream to have restaurants all over the world? No. I dreamt to have maybe two restaurants or three restaurants because Tuli at Bomane, I had this three-star restaurant and another restaurant. So I thought maybe that was good enough. But then there's opportunities. And one of the things Tuli told me, you know, my little guy, he used to call me Mon Petit. <laughs> there are going to be many opportunities in your life. A lot of these opportunities is like they will be there. It's like if you're in a train station and there are five trains there, if you don't jump on one, you're always going to be in a train station. So with the opportunity, it's the same. You have to jump on the opportunity or on the train and go somewhere. And hopefully it takes you in the right direction where you can go to the next train and to the next train. And I think that's what happened to me. I said, you know, I got this opportunity to come to America, and I did it. You know, a lot of young guys would have said, well, I feel comfortable in France. I feel comfortable in Germany. Why go to mm. America? Right. Why take the risk to losing a job? I had a great job in Paris, actually. I drove an Alfa Romeo, which for a young <laughs> kid of 23 was really cool. I could pick up girls like uh, so easily because I had a nice car. <laughs> yeah. Wolfgang, before we talk about, you know, coming to America and what that was like for you, I think there was a key part of your story that I don't want to overlook, which was when you saw that this restaurant where you were working had one Michelin star, but there was these others that had two or three, yeah. you went out of your way. You didn't have to do this. You called them up. You wrote to them, whatever you did. Yeah. You tried a way to get in touch with those folks and you got to that level. That's the key ingredient, right? That's the missing step that people don't oh. take. They're on a journey, but then they're like, okay, I guess something's going to happen, right? Yeah. Luck doesn't just happen because you're on a journey. I, in my opinion, I think luck happens because you put in the work, you put in the effort, and then you get lucky. Whether or not you realize you're lucky is a whole different story. But if you hadn't written the letters or called those different restaurants and said, hey, I want to come work for you, you would not have potentially been the Wolfgang Puck oh, that you are today. 
So you have to have the drive. Yeah, you, have you have to have to. the ambition and try to get better. Me, it wasn't about the money. It was trying to get as good as possible in what I do. And still today, it's the same. Yeah. At my age, like I looked at a video from a famous Japanese chef. I said, you know what? I wouldn't mind to go to work with him for a month. Was it Jiro? No, it wasn't oh. Jiro. It was uh, <laughs> another guy, but really good one yeah, too. Yeah. I mean, Jiro is like, what, 90, 95 years old? So. I know. I think maybe, maybe I'll wait a few <laughs> yeah. years and then we are both right. 100 and <laughs> right. then we can do a dinner together. But no. I think... I Sorry, you didn't say Yeah, that. I think it's really, to me, another restaurateur or another restaurant could have answered, why Tullier and why everything? I think it's, uh, I don't know, it's maybe in the stars. I don't know why. It could have turned out maybe better. Maybe I would have gone somewhere, I would have married the daughter of the owner, and I would still be somewhere in France in the countryside running a restaurant, yeah. hopefully happy. But you know what? When I look back at my career, at what I did, Sometimes I look back and I said, you know what? It's interesting how the whole trace, how the whole way came about where I went from Austria to Dijon to Le Beau to, to Monte Carlo to Paris and then Indianapolis and then L.A. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's why we like to focus on the early days because there's usually something there that you can sort of point to as this is sort of why this person has this mindset or has achieved this level of success. And for you, it sounds like a lot of it came from your experience with your stepfather and like wanting to sort of prove to him, like, I am going to make something out of myself. And so I guess later on in your career, um, I don't even know if the time has come yet for you, but like, did you ever think about that? Like, did you ever think, I don't know whatever happened to your stepfather and, and there, but was there ever a day or, or a feeling that you had of, all right, like I made it and I can, you know, I, at least I've proved it to myself that you know well you know what i off. did one time he came here i invited him with my mother when we already had the restaurants and uh, i drove a little mercedes and then uh, he loved it to sit in a mercedes oh my son has a mercedes you know then yeah. when i became well known he was the opposite he said it was because of him my mother <laughs> used to be so pissed off at him and says you know she used to take a kitchen towel whatever she had and says don't say that you know that's not true and so on and he yeah. always bragged about me more than the other kids which were his kids you know because <laughs> yeah. he wanted to be associated with me and i think it was really crazy i sent him the mercedes to austria i didn't go but i sent it and uh I just told my sister, you, because she lived with them, and I said, you drive the Mercedes. Don't yeah. give it to him because he's going to be drunk and demolish it. <laughs> it's crazy. So you finally make the decision. You're going to take a risk. You're going to come to America. Did you think that you, know, you would do well here, or it was it just you had to start all over? Well, I was pretty confident then in my ability. Even when I was at Maxime's in Paris, I was 23 years old, and I got the number three job in the kitchen. I had five or six or seven other French guys who were actually older than me, and the chef gave me the job as being the night chef there because we were open late. So and after 11 o'clock, I was responsible for the whole kitchen. And today, when you look at 23-year-old kid being responsible for a three-star kitchen, it's pretty out there, you know? What job was that? Yeah, well... But the restaurant was open for lunch and dinner, but I was uh, the night chef. So I used to come in at four in the afternoon and then worked. And then at uh, 10, 30, 11, when the regular dinner was over, I took over the kitchen and I had four guys with me, and sometimes more, but an average four guys with me. And we had uh, customers come after the opera, after the theater, and so forth. So sometimes it was pretty busy and sometimes not so busy. But I was in charge of it, you know. Mm -hmm. So it was really uh, an interesting experience. And the chef somehow trusted me, which was interesting, too, because they had other people. The guy I replaced was like 40 years old. Mm -hmm. So, and you know, from 23 to 40 is a lot of time, a lot of experience. And I wasn't even French, you know, so. <laughs> right. Uh, but it was a great experience for me to work at Maxime's in Paris. And then I said, okay, a, fr a friend, through a friend of mine, I got this opportunity to come to America, first to uh, New York. I didn't really like New York. And then uh, somebody offered me a job in Indianapolis. 
And it, to me, I'm a big fan of auto racing. Yep. So I love Formula One, and you know the Indy 500 are so famous all over the world. And uh, so when they offered me this job, I said, "Oh, I'm gonna go. It must be like Monaco." I used to live in Monaco, and then yeah. I took the Greyhound bus from uh, New York to Indianapolis, which took like a day and a half or whatever to get there. And then finally I arrived in Indianapolis and I said, shit, that's Indianapolis. It's <laughs> nothing like uh, Monaco, you know? <laughs> but I have no money to leave. That's yep. why I couldn't fly. I couldn't pay for the ticket. So I took the bus. And then uh, I stayed there for a year, got my green card. And, you know, I found out that people in Indiana were very nice. The Middle Westerners are very good soul. And uh, I liked it there. The girls were really nice and easy. So it was a good <laughs> thing for a young guy. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so uh, I don't know. So I want to kind of talk about, you know, the moment where you where you decided I'm going to start my own restaurant, which um, I think was Spago, right? Uh, was the was the first one? Yeah. Um, you know, obviously, as someone who's really good at their craft, right? Um, yeah. There comes a time when if you decide you want to start a business out of that craft, it's a whole different hat you have to wear that perhaps maybe you, you knew about it, maybe you didn't as far as how to run a, a successful business, right? You have margins, you have costs, you have this, you have that. You look at your P&Ls. P&Ls, all this, all this business stuff. Yeah. And so uh, I'm curious, you know, when was the moment where you decided, now's the time, I feel ready, I want to start my own restaurant, and how was that transition going from just being a chef at somebody else's restaurant to, to being the owner of your own business? Well, to me, the business, business philosophy is still really simple. You have to make more money than you spend, than you stay in <laughs> exactly. business. So it's, exactly. it's not that complicated. You don't have to go to Harvard to learn. To figure it's not, out. but sometimes you see companies these days, and I, I feel like that's sort of missing. But Yeah, totally. Uh, you know, totally. Yeah. And only now yeah. with the stock market where you can spend the money <laughs> and uh, their, their company becomes exactly. more, more uh, worth. And they don't make any money. But with a small business, you have to make money. So my mother always told me, you have to make more than you spend. Then I was at a restaurant called Ma Maison, which was down here on Melrose Avenue. And there I became the chef. The restaurant was bankrupt. My first paycheck bounced. I went in the refrigerator and looked what they cooked. I said, it looks disgusting. I wouldn't come and eat here either because they had no customers, you know. So then I cleaned up. I went to the farmer's market. I went to the fish market where the Japanese guys went. And there I bought fresh fish. I had to pay cash because nobody trusted them to get the check or whatever. Everything was on COD. And little by little, I cooked good food and our business started to grow. So I think when I started, they did like $18,000 a month, which was like nothing mm -hmm. even at that time. And then little by little, three, four months later, we did 30000 a month, so which was almost double the business already. So which, with a small kitchen, I had like one stove and uh, another two burner, and that was it. I remember for lunch, like Friday lunch, I cooked a leg of lamb, the potatoes and the apple tart all in the same time in the <laughs> oven on three layers. You know, it was crazy. And this was still someone, this was another That was Patrick Terrace restaurant called Ma Maison. Right. Yeah. And I stayed there five years. And uh, uh, the restaurant became hugely successful. I became friends with Orson Welles, with Billy Wilder, and uh, Chuck Lemon, and Dinah Shaw, and a lot of these guys who are gone now, but who were really right. famous. And like this was around what time? The, the, the late 70s. Late 70s, yeah, correct. 78, 77. So 30, 45 years ago. Crazy. And, yeah. So... <laughs> And then these customers came more and more often. But Patrick never trusted me. And at one point, I found this restaurant up on Sunset, a Russian restaurant called Kafka's, Armenian Russian restaurant. And uh, uh, I tried to rent it. It was pretty cheap. The lease was like $2,000 a month. But I went to Patrick when I got my investors already. I had a cooking school and all these uh, psychologists and dentists and lawyers we had a cooking class. We always had a party because I had a case of red wine, a case of white wine. Everybody, every team had their own stove, like two, three people together cooked like two, three dishes. And they drank a lot of wine. And at the end, I said, you know, I want to open a restaurant, and, but I don't have the money or not all the money. So maybe you, we can raise some money. And they said, oh, that would be fantastic. We want to be part of your new restaurant. So we raised $500,000. I went to Patrick. I said, you know, 
I have this location up on Sunset. I also have the money to uh, build it out. And all I want is to be 50-50 partner with you. He looked at me because he went to Cornell and fancy schools, you know. The greatest hospitality school in the country. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so he said, you know, I'm going to own 51% always. And then I finally said, me too. <laughs> so that was it. I mean, I got lucky. He said, no. Yeah. If not, he would be my 50%. Partner and why today. did you pursue or why did you approach him and want to be 50 50 partners like what what was going through your head was it because this person was experienced at running a restaurant you felt like you needed that type of partner or what no was it was really about uh we had this great clientele all the famous hollywood people used to come and mommy son was really an institution and i felt like guilty leaving you know i felt wow i built it up from $18,000 a month to $350,000 a month, which was, you know, an amazing uh, feast. And so I said, maybe we can form a company that we do 50-50. So I said, you know, we have uh, Ma Maison, and then we build a little trattoria or a pista or something up on Sunset Boulevard, not too expensive, so we are not in competition. And... So I thought, oh, it would be nice if we do it together. You know, in a way, I still felt like he was important. But at the end, people came for the food because nobody came. And he was open a year and a half before I arrived there. And even if you see my story, my life story, you know, on Disney, you can see how arrogant he still was. And he said, oh, his uncle told me he's only a chef. When I started working there, he said, uh, Wolfgang doesn't know how to cook for the Americans. Uh, you know, he, he couldn't cook at all. He didn't do anything, but he had this arrogance about himself. And uh, I think it was terrible. And so when I got the money together, we split up. It was a bad divorce. And then in 1982, in January, I opened Spago, and Spago became this amazing hit I never would have thought of. Mm -hmm. What was the inspiration behind Spago? What does it even mean? Well, Spago, I got the name actually from Giorgio Moroder, who is a famous uh, singer-songwriter. You know, he did all the music for Donna Summer, the, all the mm -hmm. synthesized music, and he did the music for Midnight Express and Top Gun and so forth. He won a few Oscars and made really good money at that time. So he said, I want to, I asked him for money to invest. And uh, he said, okay, maybe we call it Spago because I want to write a musical called Spago. And I said, okay, what does it mean? He said, oh, it means a string with no beginning and no end. I said, I don't care what we call it as long as you give me the money. You know? <laughs> I said, I call it Giorgio if you Hopefully want to. Hopefully the money has a, a beginning but no end. So yeah. just, and is, then, is that where spaghetti comes from? Yeah. Oh, it's a slang for spaghetti, apparently. Oh. Yeah. Uh, so at the end, we tried to talk to his lawyer, and I hired a lawyer too, about doing a business deal, and it ended up the same. He wanted 60% of the restaurant, and me f give me 40. I said, no, I want to be 60, 40 if you want to until you get your money back, and then we switch. I get 60, you get 40. And he said, no, 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 my risk, my money. I said, okay, then forget it. That's when I got my dentist and everybody involved after <laughs> from my cooking school. And uh, I kept the name because Spago, I told everybody I'm going to open Spago. I was sure he's going to give me the money. And he said so until we tried to make a business deal. So uh, in 82, then we opened Spago. And I had uh, like 20 investors or 15 investors. Each one put up 15000 I went to the bank. Somebody co-signed for me for $60,000. So I was the biggest investor too. And I think in a way, I got lucky not to have... Patrick is my partner because I could manage the way I wanted. And one of the things I did, we built an open kitchen. So mm -hmm. that way I can see the customers, they can see us, and we can say we have nothing to hide. You know, everything is out in the open. And uh, we prepare the best food with the best ingredients. So I went down to the Chino farm, got the best vegetables, and went to the fish market. I went to the guy who sold me the meat and choose which uh, rack of lamb or whatever I wanted. Got up northern, to Northern California, got whole lamb mm -hmm. from a farmer up there and goat cheese from a farmer up there. So it's, I think it was totally something totally new to see a restaurant with a kitchen as the center stage 
And then all of a sudden the balance shifted. A maitre d' was not as important as the chef. The manager was not as important as the chef or the owner. Everything turned to the chef because the chef was on stage. So that's changed the whole philosophy about the chef. Right. You know, that's really uh, the beginning, really, where chefs became stars in a way, mm -hmm. you know, or well-recognized, or that their profession is really a good profession, an important profession. So I think Spargo really changed the way America was thinking about chefs. Yeah. You know, that's a good point because we've talked to, on, on this podcast several chefs now, and you've seen it over the last even 10, 20 years more so, you know, with social media and just all these different media platforms that are out there that the chef is really at the center stage. You know, people want to become chefs. The chefs are not only the ones cooking the food, but they're the show, the show people, right? They're the ones entertaining, not only in the kitchen, but also, you know, the guests that come through there. Do you think that that was a challenge for you being not only the person that was in charge of the back of the house, the kitchen, getting sure, making sure, making sure the food was, you know, cooked well and the menu was enticing but at the same time also making sure you're entertaining those that would come through right at the end of the day you're the marketing guy you know they're coming for you was that a challenge for you well you know i always thought i'm in the hospitality business so it's not what i serve the guests how do i gonna make the guests feel if they feel really good when they leave the restaurant they're gonna come back for sure so to make them feel good, food alone is not enough. You have to really be personable. You really have to be humble. You really have to make them feel they are very important. And where some of the owners of restaurants, they felt more important than the guests. Right. So to me, it's always we are in the hospitality business, and I think I liked it from the beginning to say hello to the guests, to go out in the dining room and greet them and so forth. So I think, did I make a plan for that? No. I just thought, thought it was natural. Yeah. And you talk about <clears throat> sort of the open kitchen plan and how it was a new phenomenon, you know, was something that people hadn't really seen before. And I think it's important, you know, that you, you sort of had this like innovative mindset to, to what you were doing. You weren't just starting a restaurant yeah. like everything else. So how important do you think that is for and because it is a business at the end of the day right and so how important do you think having this sort of innovation hat is when it comes to at least what well, you're doing if you're a singer songwriter today and you come up with a new melody with a new uh, story you know to tell and if it's really good people will enjoy it and uh turn on the radio or nobody buys it or download it you know or whatever it is so i think the same thing was when I opened Spargo, it was different. The kitchen was out the open. The food was simple, but the ingredients were the best ingredients. The ambiance was fun. I wanted people to have fun. I didn't want to uh, dress the waiters in a tuxedo. You know, if you wear a suit with a tie, you act different than if you are in a relaxed outfit. So I think to me, it was all about taking care of the guests and make them feel welcome, have fun in the restaurant. But have great food, mm -hmm. have great quality ingredients without making them so complicated. So we had a wood-burning oven, we had a wood-burning grill and everything, so we grilled everything to order. and So it was simple but delicious. Mm -hmm. What are you like as a manager, as somebody who leads a team of chefs, a team of folks that are not in the restaurant, you know, your lawyers, accountants, what are you like as a leader? Well, I really think I'm very easy as long as everybody does what I want. So <laughs> <laughs> That's the best way, right? But, yeah, but I listen to the young people a lot now, yeah. including my son, Byron, you know, who runs our restaurant, Meroa. So I said, you know, it's, they are the future. If I talk to somebody my age, you know, they, I pretty know well what they are thinking or how they like to eat or whatever. But the young people are different. So we have to really figure out how we're going to stay in business. So staying in business, obviously, we all want to. You know, you don't want to invest the money and then fail. Restaurant failure is crazy how high it is, more than any other business. And I really think through having two points, having tradition and innovation mixed together. Because when you come to a restaurant, and you like a certain dish, and you go back the next day, they don't have it anymore. The next day, they don't have it anymore. You feel disappointed. So you have to have 
some reference points, some dishes. But if you keep the same thing all the time, what will happen? People get bored. Right. So especially these days where they learn so much on all these cooking shows and so forth, where they are much more able to try new things and mm -hmm. much more interested to try new things. In the old time, I remember when I tried to sell sea urchins. Mm. Now we sell a lot. <laughs> In the 80s, they said sea urchin. Ooh, I don't even want to smell them, you know. <laughs> it was terrible. It's like or, a delicacy. Huh? It's like yeah, a delicacy now. Totally. Or having a fish undercooked. Right. Mm. You know, if you cook a, a salmon medium rare, it's much better than if it's well done. But at that time... I remember people used to send it back and say, tell Wolfgang to learn how to cook fish. It's not well done. <laughs> I just put my hand on my head and I said, what the heck? How are we going to change their mind? I was born better. 20 years too early. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm curious, as, as like Spago became more and more successful, as you started thinking about opening up more and more restaurants, what sort of things were you looking at? Was it like trends? Was it, was it purely what you thought people would like? Like, obviously it was probably a combination of both, but how are you going about thinking about, you know, what the next restaurant's going to be and what the next restaurant's going to be? You know, it was so interesting. Like I like, I'm very curious. So I like new things. Even now at my age, I like new things. Curiosity is one of the most important things in life. I think if you want to keep on going, you know, if you're not curious anymore, it means you don't want to learn anymore and, you know, you might as well pack your bag and go to Florida on vacation, you know. Mm. So I think uh, uh, for me, but now I forgot the question. I went on. It was more so, you know, you, you're talking about how your curiosity led you to start the next yeah. restaurant and the next restaurant. Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, so when I opened Spago here in West Hollywood in 1982, the Japanese came and they wanted a Spago in Tokyo. And I said, I cannot really run one restaurant well yet. You know, we was so crazy, so busy. And I used to sit and look out the window and say, oh, my God, I don't know how I'm going to wake up. Because people used to call me up. Hi, Wolfgang. This is so-and-so. I'm coming tonight for six people. And before I could say, I'm too busy, they hung up. So I didn't have the number, nothing. So they, all of a sudden they showed up. I said, oh, shit, now they're here. Where are we going to set them? You know, it was crazy. But then, so we opened Spago in Tokyo, which I didn't really want to do, but they forced me in almost because they said, we're going to open it with or without you. And uh, so I said, okay, let's open it with me. And they gave me one third of the business. And then the next people came up in Santa Monica and they said, oh, we should open a Spago in Santa Monica. And, you know, it's far away from Spago in West Hollywood. And I, I tried to get rid of these people. And I said, you know what? I don't want to do a Spago anymore. I want to do a Chinese restaurant. Mm. They looked at me and said, okay, I'm sure if you're going to do a Chinese restaurant, that it will be good. Chinois. <laughs> And then we opened Chinois, and which came a new sensation because nobody did food like that before, where you mix techniques from the uh, West, from France, what I learned, with all the ingredients and flavors from the East. So I think it became this hot new thing and uh, busy like crazy. I remember when Warren Beatty and Madonna showed up and Elizabeth Taylor showed up and all these people came all of a sudden down to Santa Monica Main Street. Do you think that you played a role in elevating the tastes of Americans? We definitely showed them new tastes and tried to make them experience new tastes. I think they felt more comfortable when they saw the kitchen and the dining room. Mm -hmm. Certainly, they were, during the 80s was the beginning of a food revolution in America. I remember right out here on these terraces, we did the American Food and Wine Festival. I invited... Alice Waters and Paul Poydom and Larry Foggione and all these chefs from all over the country. Each one had their stand. People came and uh, tasted the food. I was always, for me, it was always important to give back to society because I thought I got really lucky. And then uh, we raised money for Meals on Wheels and uh, gave them uh, some money for the people who have uh, no food. So, oh, yeah. uh, but I think there were a few chefs in different parts of the country who were also important that the American people really believed American chefs are good and uh, that they are more willing to try new things. Yeah. You know, and, and we've had Alice Waters on the show and she's an incredible person and, and chef as well. And um, I'm curious, you looking back at all, the, all of this and everything you've built and this entire, I guess, you know, I mean, hospitality empire that you've built, what are you most proud of? 
I'm most proud of probably that I have four sons and they're doing a great job and that I'm still married to my second <laughs> wife. I think that's the hardest thing, you know. In the restaurant, I can tell people, do this, do that. At home, if I tell to the wife, uh, do this, do that, she will do the different, and I shouldn't do that <laughs> anyway. And even with the kids now, they look at me and say, well, we're on vacation, you know. Yeah. But I think that's certainly for me an important part. And if I look today and say, what would I like on my tombstone? I'm, I much rather would have, uh, you know, that the kids say he was a great father and maybe the wife said he was a good husband instead of saying he made great restaurants. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wolfgang, I'm curious, you know, this past year obviously was a challenge for everyone, but more so for the restaurant business and for hospitality in general. Uh, you know, obviously I'm referring to the pandemic here and, you know, folks had to lose their jobs and people like us didn't have the opportunity to go out to restaurants to dine. What was it like for you, you know, as the owner of, you know, all these businesses, as the leader of all of these chefs and people that would work for your companies? What was going on through your head when the news first hit and you didn't even know what to think? Right? Yeah. And I think what was really crazy that when they shut us all down, and we said, what are we going to do? Well, we had so much meat and stuff like that left in the refrigerator in all different restaurants. So we started a takeout business. And I was so generous in the beginning. You know, we had our regulars coming and I gave them for $49. They had like a four-course meal. Normally at the <laughs> restaurant would cost $100. But I said, okay, I got rid of that in two weeks or in three weeks. We'll be open again and the people are going to say thank you. We had a great time and thank you for your takeout. But then... It kept on going and going, and we found new venues to do some business and keep our employees going. And uh, like on uh, Sunday or we did on Wednesday, we did fried chicken night. We never made fried chicken at Spago. <laughs> we had a line for two blocks for people to pick up fried chicken. Mm. And it was crazy. The whole kitchen was full of oil, and uh, you know <laughs> we were frying and frying and frying like crazy. So... Then we finally opened again in uh, July, and business was good. We could use the outside only, no inside. And at Spago, we were lucky, and at Chinoa, we were lucky. We had the big outside, some restaurants like downtown, uh, where we had no outside. We had to close, uh, cut in Beverly Hills. We're just going to open now because uh, first we couldn't find now people to work, but also there's no outside. So I think then uh, the restaurant like Spago was doing well. Vegas was closed too because uh, of the pandemic. And then they opened again at, uh, I think, one third occupancy or 25% occupancy. But it was better than nothing. Not that they we're going to make money, hopefully not to lose too much. Mm -hmm. And then I think really when we closed again in November here, it was really difficult because we did well. And then we closed until after Valentine's Day. I had them build a, a big pavilion at Spago, so you really feel like outside. And uh, I saw the in case it rains, the whole thing was delayed. Cost me like four hundred thousand dollars or wow. so the whole pavilion. But we use it today, and I think now business is back better than ever. People want to go out. People want to have a good time. Yeah. So. I think it's great. Las Vegas, all of our restaurants doing uh, really well. Some places we got a backlash, like in London, all of a sudden, you know, the Indian strain came right. out. I had 12 people in the kitchen in London who got it, young people who didn't get vaccinated mm -hmm. yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we closed down for three weeks there. Now we open again, and uh, so everything seems good. And Turkey is doing well. We just opened in Budapest a few days ago. And it seems like everybody wants to go there, so it's uh, yeah, it's exciting. How do you manage your life, like your time? I was going to ask, yeah, like what does a day in your <laughs> life look like? Because you have all these restaurants, you obviously do a lot of media too. You have all these other things going on. Like, how did you? How do you go about? Well, I think life? I don't have really a fixed schedule. Yeah. So I go wherever I want to go. So it's not like I said, okay, I go there. Well, there are days when I make appointments, like with you here. So I'm here in the office. If not, uh, I might be playing tennis or something. Nice. But nice. I think uh, I think so. I have things, appointments, but the main thing is running the restaurant. So that's mm -hmm. time consuming. So if, for example, uh, Meroa upon sunset, where my son, who is really young, 26 years old, and he went to Cornell, too, and worked in some of the great kitchens. So I'm very proud of him with what he's doing. 
but I still go up there and check on him. You know, I don't want him to fail. I don't want him to be successful. And I'm trying to give him my advice, my wisdom, what I have learned. And, you know, I let him experience do certain things. I said, you know, failure is not bad as long as you learn from it. You know, failure, if you do nothing, then you are a failure. But if you do something, you try your best and hopefully people will love it. So, I think he's doing a great job so far, but I go there, I go down to Chinois, I go, was today at lunchtime at the Bel Air Hotel at the meeting, then came here, I had to meet with the accountants, I almost <laughs> fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> where, where do you see the future of hospitality, you know, whether it's in the next three years, five years and beyond, wh where do we land? I mean, are things going to look like they do now or is it going to be completely different? I think there's a consistent change, a consistent evolution. It's not radical. Like there was a bigger evolution in the early 80s when chefs became uh, personalities. Right. Now that whole foundation is there already. Yes, there's somebody going to come up with a new way to do Thai food or Austrian food, maybe. But it won't be that new anymore because a lot of things were done. There's always the possibility that people are going to come up with new things. I think it's totally normal. And I think uh, uh, we're going to continue. And I really believe that America today in food and in wine is second to none. Mm. When I came here, you know, everybody said, if you didn't have a French chef or an Italian chef in your restaurant, uh, nobody would go. If you said you have an American as the chef, they would look at you as an American, the chef. What do you mean? You couldn't find a Swiss guy? <laughs> <laughs> and these days, it's the opposite. Yeah. You know, we have so many young, talented American chefs now. And one of the things what helped that is television. Mm. You know, people saw chefs almost like rock stars on television. And some of the young people forget you know, that you have to learn your profession. If you want to be a musician, you have to learn maybe how to read notes or you have such good ear or how to play the piano to be a successful musician. You know, you mm -hmm. can go on stage before that. And I, say, I really think America is in great hands in the future of hospitality. You know, we live in L.A., right? You know, and it's not, it's not a hidden secret that homelessness and food deserts are a massive problem here. You know, how do you see chefs like yourself and others in hospitality? Because I've kind of lost hope in our politicians. Um, how do you see hospitality players playing a role in helping find solutions? I really believe we can get better organized in, for example, the supermarkets. How much gets thrown away? It's crazy. You know, you could live out of the garbage can because if some apple has a little blemish, mm -hmm. they can't put it out there anymore. You know, people will complain. But if you cut out a little piece and make apple pie, you're going to have a great apple pie. So, and the same thing is with an onion or a potato or whatever. So I really think if we would get together with all these supermarkets alone and God knows how many hundreds we have in LA and say, okay, let's set up somewhere a big kitchen. Let's make good food for kids in the schools. Let's make good food for the homeless people. So that way they feel like human beings too. And hopefully somebody has to figure out the saying, where are we going to put this homeless? Some are not able to live by themselves. Some need help really. And some need really help to get a job, get back on their feet, especially after the pandemic now. You know, so many people are out there and it's really so sad to see that in the richest country in the world, that in a city like LA, we have 60 or 70,000 homeless. I think it's above, it's, I think it's more than 100,000 now. Yeah, it's totally, totally crazy. Yeah. Um, obviously, your like, whole, most of your life has been revolved around food and hospitality. Uh, I'm curious if, if for some reason you didn't go down that path, um, what, what else would could you imagine you would have done you you mentioned music a couple of times you brought it up as an yeah. example uh, is there is there anything like uh, maybe pr perhaps is talking about your interests or passions outside of yeah. food but what would you have done i probably would have loved to become a painter and artist i think i became friends with many from andy warhol to robert rauschenberg to uh, elsewhere kelly and uh, now the younger one or the older one still like ed Rocher or mark bradford or 
Julie Meheritu. So there are a lot of them, and I really admire them because they always have to come up with a new thing, too. Mm -hmm. If they want to do a show, they have to do new paintings and everything. I really thought that this is a great thing where you could have maybe where people can see and look at a painting, you know, and say, wow, I know this is a Pasquiao, or I know this is a Liechtenstein, but it's still different than what I did three years ago. And I think that would be probably something I would love to do. And I always used to doodle around and do things, but to get good, you have to spend the time. If President George W. Bush can figure out how to paint, I think, you know, you as a chef who's put together some amazing dishes can probably figure it out too. I think you can figure it out, but you know, Bush is out of a job now, so he has more time than me. <laughs> I think it would be pretty, I don't know if you've ever painted something and put it out there to the public, but I think it would be pretty awesome. Like, I could just imagine the headline, like Wolfgang Puck becomes a, just like, now he's a painter now. He's, yeah. <laughs> he's moving on. It would on. be great if I would go, I would go away somewhere for a year, learn how to paint, learn some things, and find my own style and do something and surprise everybody. It would be amazing. The same thing I said, it would be amazing if I would go like with the best sushi chef, like Shiro or somebody like that, and then do that cuisine and really master it and really do a great job and surprise people. Maybe not do it for the rest of my <laughs> life, but just to show them, look what anybody can do today. Right. I love right. it. I'm sure we could sit down and talk for hours and hours and hours, but I know we've, you've got to go. We've got to go. We thank you for your time and just sharing all these incredible stories. And I'm sure that there's going to be decades more of stories to tell. Uh, so maybe when you're 82, we can have you on the show again, and you'll tell us well, how you became just one of the greatest artists of of the decade. <laughs> so uh, thank you, Wolfgang, for thank your you. time. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure, and hopefully you enjoy. Did you see the movie already? My documentary. We did not. We're going to check it out. So it's on Disney Plus. On Disney Plus. Uh, a week ago, a week not ago. even. Yeah. Um, so today is what June 30th. Well, by the time we release this, it'll be like early July. So. Yeah. yeah. So It'll be a few days before this exact podcast. I'm to watch this. I imagine you dive more deeper into like your. You're gonna role. see, and I want people to see how I grew up through the adversity I had and the problems I had, and still feel confident. And I think people should dream, and the young kids should say, you know, Wolfgang wasn't born opening Spago. He did a lot of work before that, and I think that's really important that people know. That no is not an answer and that you have to stick to your dreams. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you for just being so open about your story and, and sort of your experiences, not thank just uh, on this podcast, but also on the, on the documentary. And we're excited to check it out. But uh, this has been incredible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank All you, right. Chef.